Welcome to the Educator Spotlight Series. I'm Maggie from Amplify. I'm here today with Julie, and we are so thrilled that you could join us for the special look at our phenomena-based curriculum from the Educator Lens. Some of you may have heard of Amplify Science before or are currently piloting the program. We know that many of you are learning about it for the first time, so before we begin, I'll tell you a little bit more about the program. Amplify Science was developed by the science education experts at UC Berkeley's Lawrence Hall of Science and the digital learning team at Amplify. The curriculum blends hand-on investigations, literacy-rich activities, and interactive digital tools to empower students to think, read, write, and argue like real scientists and engineers. But today uh, isn't just about Amplify Science. Our amazing educators have taken our curriculum to a whole new level and are coming up with amazing and creative ways to connect with our students, increase engagement, and maintain hands-on investigations through remote learning. We could not be more impressed by them, and we hope this helps you identify what is possible when you bring Amplify Science into your classrooms. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. Please remain on mute until the QA portion uh, of the webinar. And if you have any questions for Julie, please drop them in the chat or the QA box below. I will be monitoring those as we go and we'll be sure to include them in our final Q&A um, or we'll give you the opportunity to unmute yourself and you can ask Julie your questions directly. Uh, another one more thing to note is that along the bottom of your screen, you should see a button that says CC live transcript on the bottom right, and you can use that for real time closed captioning. And so without further ado, Julie Moore. Well, hello, everyone. Um, when Maggie contacted me about talking today, I was really excited because we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is adapting instruction. Um, to keep students engaged in your ever-changing classroom. And um, so we'll start with, this is my classroom. Um, really, that's not really my classroom. That's just the furniture in my classroom. This is my classroom. Um, this is also my classroom. Um, it is never a quiet place. Um, but now, you know, this year, my classroom looked a lot different. And here are lots of ways that I was trying to reach students this year um, through Zoom, through the Amplified platform, through Google Sites, through Legos, through YouTube. So I think this year was such a wild year in thinking about all the crazy ways that we needed to change our classroom dynamic. But when I stopped and thought about it, really every year is like that. There's always changes. We have new students, we have new programs, we have new protocols. Um, so, but this year kind of brought that really to light, I think for a lot of us, how much our classroom dynamic changes um, constantly and how we can adapt our instruction to meet those needs. So, you know, this year, I don't know for you, but for most of my year, I was connected to students through screens. Um, and I think a lot of this, I love this quote, is that I did then what I knew how to do. And now that I know better, I can do better. So I want to talk, I guess, about how as teachers, we all know lots of strategies that it will engage our students. But as rules change or programs come into play, um, we often find ourselves shifting this year, of course, more radically um, than other years. And this is my classroom now um, following the school mandates that we have. So this presentation is going to be about how can you adapt your instruction by thinking about what has been successful in engaging students in content in the past and then determining how that same strategy that was successful can be adapted to different students or different classroom settings. So the three things that I that I kind of focus on as I'm thinking about shifting with my classroom are these three things, because these three things universally work, no matter what your classroom or setting or program or students are. And those three things are, I'm constantly modeling scientific thinking. I'm constantly trying to create the sense of wonder about the world. And I'm constantly trying to make sure that the products that I offer my students not only engage them in the process of acquiring the information, but also extend the learning for them. And those things, those three things can be transferred and adapted based on your student needs and shifting classroom. Um, so let's start with modeling scientific thinking. Um, you know, Amplify's program and also just general science programs that I have seen are built on this kind of inquiry learning that there's this general assumption that humans have an innate urge to figure things out. We are 
children are naturally curious. They're naturally wanting to figure out what's happening in their world. So if we help them develop the intellectual discipline and the thinking skills by helping them learn how to ask questions and get answers, then we can get them thinking like scientists. Um, so I'm constantly taking pictures. You know, why is my mask fogging up now that I mean, why are my glasses fogging up now that I'm wearing a mask all the time? Um, all right, guys. This is a picture of, you know, why is my coffee making this fog on my window in the morning? Why does snow not melt on my cat? Why did the ice storm look like this? So my kids know that I'm going to walk into class almost every day or put on our website pictures of things that I've been wondering about. Why when it was there was snow and they put ice, I mean, snow melt on it. Why did that snow melt stay on my driveway, even though the snow was gone? Um, what are these little burrs that are all over me when I hike? So I model that natural curiosity to my students. Whenever we are studying something, I'm just constantly looking for relevant information that I can share with them. So my students see me as a scientist. They believe wholeheartedly that I am a scientist and they also see themselves as scientists. And I think that's incredibly important. I love this Valentine, this kid sent me that she said, thank you for making me a science nerd. Um, we are really scientists in my classroom. And I think that's the cornerstone of really engaging students no matter what the setting is. So um, they know about the practices, they know about how science transcends across disciplines, they see role models in scientists that we bring in. So that's the first step is, is really modeling scientific thinking, getting them to think and question and inquire. The second step I think is incredibly important in, in adapting, shifting wherever you are is to create this sense of wonder. Um, you know, if you're at home, if you're on a hike, if you're in your classroom, um, getting kids to notice phenomenon, things that are observable to them, um, and we can carefully place those phenomenon to drive them to be asked questions and investigate. Um, of course, Amplify does a great job with that. We can also find phenomenon that are local um, to spark curiosity. We can find phenomenon in the local news, but whatever will engage your students in wanting to ask questions and, and delve into investigating. So here's a picture of me. The kids didn't believe that the moon and the sun um, could be seen at the same time. So I took a picture. Um, here is an Amplify phenomenon, this artifact that they're trying to figure out what, what's missing in this piece of, of a found artifact. Um, this day we were on a local university campus and the kids had two shadows. And why was that happening? You know, all of these things no matter where you are, if you get the kids looking, then they start asking questions and then you can connect it to the content. Um, this is Red River Gorge, which I'm from Kentucky. So this is a local um, phenomenon and it connected perfectly to what my fourth graders were studying. So, and then it, it tied right into Amplify's phenomenon. So the second thing for me is, is creating wonder through phenomenon. And the third thing is, is really carefully chosen products. And, and the rest of what we're gonna talk about in, the, in this presentation is how can I adapt um, what I have in my classroom or in remote instruction or what students are in my classroom or what program I've been given um, to engage learners and extend them. And I think a lot of that has to do with what you ask them to do with the information. Um, I attended the Amplify Leadership Institute last year, right before COVID kind of created a travel lockdown. And I think one of the big aha moments for me was um, not to implement with fidelity, but the word that they used, the Lawrence Hall of Science people used was implement with integrity. And I've been teaching for almost 20 years. And, and for me, I needed that permission somehow. Um, I you know, I've been given lots of different programs to teach from. I have seen things come and go. And there were so many pieces and parts of the Amplify curriculum that I absolutely loved. I loved the phenomenon approach. I loved the hands-on learning, but I was struggling not to, you know, put my own spin in things to adapt it to my learners. So when I heard the, the phrase implement with integrity, the idea there is, is use the program and use the phenomenon and use all these pieces and parts, but also keep the intent 
and adapt for what your students need. So the next part of this, I'm gonna kind of go through some Amplify units that I use with my students and show you how I have adapted them both for remote instruction or because of the needs of my students. So the first one that I wanna look at is the fifth grade patterns of earth and sky, which is based on the NGSS standards of space systems for fifth grade. Um, so again, I, I showed you, you know, I still use this local phenomenon of the moon and the sun being visible at the same time. Um, kids just mind blown when you point that out to them because it breaks that misconception that when the sun goes down, the moon comes up. And so asking them to try to figure out why that happens, you know, propels them in this state of, wait a minute, I thought one thing and, and it doesn't actually apply in this case. So, you know, there are great models, there's simulations we can jump into. And if you were remote, you may have used more online simulations. Um, for me, I was lucky I could adapt and send home kits. So this is a kit that I made and sent home with my students um, so that we could continue to do hands-on learning through Zoom. Um, on the right-hand side here is inside my classroom. My students were studying how, you know, stars aren't actually on the same plane. They're actually different distances from the viewer on earth. So you can see the students are holding little balls at different distances. On the left, you can see how we adapted that in Zoom um, to show that, you know, the kids in the Zoom screen on the left have two different balls. They have a blow up beach ball and a little teeny um, bouncy ball and they're holding them at different distances to show that to me as the Zoom viewer, they look the same. Or in the middle screen where you just see the colored like stained glass, we were talking about how the sun can you know block out my view of the other stars so they put you know an object that was very bright close to the camera which blocked out the rest of the room so it it's doable to adapt um, same content same concept different learners different situation um, here is a student's interpretation uh, an artistic interpretation of that same moment um she's like you know whoops i'm kind of photobombing i'm the sun and i'm photobombing all these stars so being open to the product that the student creates this child is incredibly divergent thinking incredibly artistic and for her this was a great way to to share her understanding um we did a shadow extension. So again, this is the implementation with integrity. For me, my kids wanted to go into the shadows because I showed you that phenomenon with the two shadows. So they wanted to look at patterns of shadows. That's not really part of the, of the Amplify program, but we had time. So we did a shadow with extension and we looked at data. We used um, Google SketchUp to do shadows over time. Um, and then the kids did an art extension where they actually made two pictures at two different times of year showing the shadow. Um, again, this particular class had experienced that event on a local campus and still was very interested in the shadows. So for that a class, adapting to a shadow extension to follow their curiosity seemed really important. Um, this year, working remote, um, we decided to do a STEAM extension with um, this class was much more interested in constellations after figuring out the artifact. They were very jazzed about looking at constellations and then using their art forms to um, show what they knew about patterns. And I'll show you just a little clip. This student um, did a drum. Um, he did the seasons, he picked a constellation and then set up his percussive instruments to do his interpretation of each of those constellations and then turned in a report about them. This student did a dance um, with glow sticks of different constellations and she actually had these embedded in a slideshow. So again, I think the point here is, is allowing students you know, being willing to follow your students in their interest within the unit and also making sure there is a phenomenon that grounds the inquiry allows you to adapt um, the product a little bit more. Um, we'll look at another one. Sorry, I'm stuck. Okay, another one. So this is fourth grade waves, energy, and information. Um, if you're familiar with Amplify's version, they are looking at uh, mother dolphins communicating with their calves using um, 
sound waves and underwater sound. This, of course, is based on the NGSS waves and information standards. So this is um, in my classroom, allowing kids a hands-on, the phenomenon was waves in water. The kids start exploring waves. I wanted to point out, I, I love, 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 love having kids draw their ideas to explain their thinking. Um, if you're familiar with Amplify, it's, it's often optional to draw. It is always required in my class to draw. And I think that the kids really think through things. Again, using online simulations was great. Um, a easily adaptable thing for remote instruction. Um, and then of course, in my classroom, we built, um, we made instruments out of straws. Now, of course, with COVID, that involved adapting, um, making a change to instruction. Um, because obviously we weren't in the classroom and, and we are now back in the classroom, but I don't think that we'll be blowing straws. That just seems like it wouldn't follow um, some of the breathing restrictions. So we, you know, change it up. I took to YouTube, the kids, you know, I've taken to TikTok, I've taken to um, Snapchat, I've taken to having Bitmoji. So in this case, I made a video, which I won't show you the whole thing, but essentially, I'm drinking my coffee, talking to the kids, and I'm going to scoot it ahead a little bit because essentially I wanted to show them this. So as I was trying to teach and prepare to teach them, my son was sitting next to me with this tube making all sorts of noise. So this became my driving force for the lesson. I told the kids in the YouTube video, you know, my son's making all sorts of crazy noises. And I'm wondering if you can figure out how to make crazy noises. Is there a way you can use vibrations to make crazy noises? And that ended up in a flip grid called the symphony. Now their homeroom teacher's name is Beers. So it was the Beers symphony and the students all created their own instruments at home in remote instruction and put them in the flip grid and then explained how they used waves and vibrations to make their instruments. Um, you know, this is, is the process that I go through as I adapt each of these units. I think about what is the setting? What are the kids? And how can I hook them into what we're doing? Um, this is Earth's feature. You know, these are all lessons that are within Amplify. They're all great. They're all um, based on those pictures that I showed you of the gorge, you know, strata and making levels and different layering over time, um, sending things home to them. Like, let's, you know, do a sugar shake where you put the cubes in. This was a take home kit. This was in my classroom, letting them observe different rocks. Um, this was in this particular class, these kids had it, were having a really difficult time with composing explanations. They were really, really struggling. So this is a protocol that I tried with this class where they wrote their explanations as pairs, and then they each had a colored marker and they went around the room museum style. And as they were reading other people's explanations, they just put a check if they agreed with that statement or thought that statement helped develop the explanation. They could put a question mark. And so this is students walking around the room, um, giving feedback, but also getting their own internal dialogue of like, oh, this is how this group did an explanation. So again, this particular class was really struggling independently writing written explanations. So it was easy to adapt the lesson to meet their needs. Um, this is another adaptation. We were reading this year through the eyes of geologists, which is part of the Earth Features Unit and Amplify. We got to the end, it was about Mammoth Cave. And the kids this year were just like, oh my goodness, Mammoth Cave, we don't get to go to Mammoth Cave this year because it's our annual field trip for fourth grade. And they were like, how could we, you know, celebrate this still or do something with this? They were really bummed about that. So we decided, um, that we would do our own fossil studies. So I went out and collected a bunch of local fossils because I live in this region. 
Um, and then the kids did a bunch of research and they developed artwork of what prehistoric life based on the Mammoth Cave fossil record might have looked like, which happens to be the National Park Service's um, fossil day competition this year is to choose a national park and illustrate it for um, its prehistoric version. So again, you know, adapting to meet the needs of the students. This was a group of kids that were bummed about not getting to go on a field trip. So we turned it into a really cool art experience that still was getting them looking at the fossil record and how the world has changed um, since that time. So I, I mean, I could continue. Um, I'm gonna do one more and then I'll, I'll stop because I know that your time is valuable. Um, this was the Earth system, fifth grade Earth system, based on um, NGS's Earth systems. Um, this was how we adapted the forming water drop formation lesson. You know, we were sitting in Zoom. Every kid had a cup of ice at home, but we had to let it sit. You know, usually in the classroom, you would do something else for a little while while that ice was sitting, and you were waiting for condensation to happen. So in this case. We all jumped on Chrome Canvas and we drew examples of condensation occurring in our real world. So these are some of the ones that kids were drawing as we were waiting for the condensation to form. Um, on the left, you can see in Zoom, a kid sharing their condensation. And on the right, you can see um, live and in action. So just another case of adapting a lesson that was effective in the classroom and how can we change it to remote instruction. Um, this is a book from that same unit, Drinking Cleopatra's Tears. The kids made it a cross-curricular experience with what they had been studying in history. So they illustrated and then of course in, in remote instruction, we turn those into digital drawings. So, um, and then, you know, making lemonade out of lemons it was really fun. I mean, we're back in the classroom now, but it was really fun, all the opportunities that kids could have in their own environments to create their own examples. So these are just a couple examples that kids took pictures of evaporation and condensation around their homes. So I'll stop there. Um, you know, I could, like I said- okay, so I'm gonna show you my second. Oh, sorry. I'm passionate about how you can adapt all of these units to, make them meet the needs of your students, but I will stop there because I'm at 20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Julie. Um, we already have some questions. Um, Rebecca wants to know, uh, well, Rebecca said, so you have so many great examples um, of adapting to meet the needs and interests of your students. Um, like how have you gone about um, making sure that you can, like how do you find the ways that are the things that your, your students, their, their needs and their interests? How do I? Fine. Oh, how like, do you figure out what their needs and interests are? I should say. Okay. Sorry, um, I read that a little wrong. <laughs> no, no, no. Totally fine. So, um, I mean, I think over time, as I've been more familiar with content, more familiar as a teacher myself, and more comfortable with as a teacher, I have a lot of open dialogue with my students. Um, so, and I'm also very adaptable. I think that I, I do think that's one of the pros of this particular curriculum too. Is it doesn't fill up my entire year. So I have the space to run with my students when there's a piece that they're very interested in. So I think that um, for me, it's a being able to adapt and being open to adapting and then just listening. You know, oh, you guys are really interested in this part and then thinking, how can I take this part and, and blow it up a little bit for them? That's a great point. Just taking so, so you see that that little those sparks flying, you're like, ooh, well, let's let's put, add more fire to that flame. Yeah, see how yeah. far it goes. It's such yeah. a great way to go about it, especially with your students who are all so creative. <laughs> I, love seeing I, I just realized I didn't get to the ergs. The ergstown one was really fun because I had a group that got way into. I don't know if you all are familiar with the um, energy in Ergstown. Um, that particular year, I had a group of kids that were way into building. And so they actually built an entire physical model of Ergstown out of Legos and then wired the entire thing and then labeled all the places that, you know, the system could have gone down. Um, so I think it's just being willing to go on those avenues and listen to what kids are interested in doing. That's incredible. I would love to see more of that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a picture. Um, I can pull it up in a minute, but I know. Perfect. <laughs> Um, and then I, we, uh, um, ML, if you can have Debbie Sheldon come off of mute um, and so she can ask Julie her question directly. Hi, 
Oh, sorry, I didn't have a question. I must have just hit it. That was very okay. interesting. Well, That's thank okay, you. thanks, Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else want to ask Julie a question or want to drop it into the chat if you're not feeling like coming online or coming off mute? Um, we'll take a few minutes and give people some time to think about them. I can pull up, let me pull up that picture while I know it's in here. It, it was really incredible what the kids did. I can kind of skip past the, some of these other things um, and see if I can find it real quick. Yeah, this was um, this is one of the builds for Ergstown, where they took the solar panel circuit and then they extended it into a full city with Legos. So this is so impressive. <laughs> and we had they were all over the room, and then the librarian was really awesome and let us display them in the library so that kids could really look at them. That is so cool. And I love that their, their hard work and their creativity were all on display. That's amazing. Yeah. We need more of that. <laughs> Could um, I ask a quick question? Sure. Since you, you prompted me. Um, I don't know. I'm preschool, multiple disabled, and they want me to do more science lessons. Do you have any suggestions for beginner budding scientists? I, I mean, I, I actually started with preschool. Um, so I, you know, I, when I think back to, to teaching preschool and, and I taught in a K-5 STEM lab too, you know, my very favorite thing with preschool and kindergarten is the question box. And so I always start a lesson with kindergarten or pre-K I have a box that I just painted a big question on it and I put an object inside the box that's kind of the inspiration for what we're going to do like um, there's a kindergarten standard about um, an, uh, how animals change their environment to meet their needs and so I might put you know a stuffed animal beaver in there and then I let the kids ask yes or no questions which I think one of the most important parts for for our pre-K kiddos and our kindergarten kiddos is to nurture asking really good questions that are investigatable because they ask questions all the time, but, you know, getting them to listen to answers and then ask questions based on what's happening. So I would open the floor to ask questions. A kid might say, is the thing alive? Um, and I'd say, well, it's not alive, but it's a model of something that's alive. And then if the next kid said, does it move? I would say, well, could it move? if that's the answer that we just got. So, I mean, that's one of my favorite things to do is, is start with that to create the wonder, you know, and you can put anything in the question box. One time I put a praying mantis, a living praying mantis <laughs> in the box. And when I took the top off, you know, it, it kind of came out and they were like, whoa, you know? So I think you can put whatever you want, but then that then becomes the inspiration for, you know, if you were doing float and sink or something like that, you know, you put a boat in there and then you're like, today you guys are going to get to explore with a boat like this, because I want you to try to figure this out for me. Um, and that, that's how I approach the little people is I always started with that kind of question box. And then they were so excited when they figured out what was in the question box. And then I would say today, you're going to get to do this with the question box. And the other thing that I did with my K's um, was a lot of station work, you know, their attention span is, is short, you know, so we would do kind of a, a 10 minute I would take the, what I wanted to cover and break it into three or four 10 minute things and say, and let them explore in that, you know, little five and 10 minute segments and then bring it back together to something. Oh, thank you. That was very helpful. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, we have time for one more question. Um, Rebecca says, many schools struggle to have enough time for science in K through five. Um, and she is curious about the systems that you have in place. How do you have time to teach all the units and still have time for adaptations? Yeah, um, so that I, I feel you on two levels here. I, I was a fourth grade classroom teacher, all subjects for 13 years. So when I taught in that scenario, I centered everything around science. So every unit that we did, I centered around science. Now I know that doesn't always 
work because different districts and different school systems have different mandates. So you may have a reading program or a writing program that you have to follow. And that gets a lot trickier. Um, in our district, when we adopted a reading program and a science program at the same time, um, I actually went to the administrators at a district level and said, okay, I would like release time to take the new reading program and the new science program and figure out where the cross is um, so that I can know what stories and what units will actually match this so we can try to you know, get more bang for the buck. So that is one thing. In the school I teach currently, I am blessed that as a school, they decided to put a certain protected time around science. So I actually, all of our fourth graders, all of our fifth graders and all of our sixth graders come to my lab for 45 minutes a day, which I know is incredibly unusual. So in this situation, it's you know a, a dream situation as far as having protected science time. But when I was a classroom teacher and did not have that, I tried to center everything I was doing around science content. Uh, so we are out of time and thank you so much julie for awesome. participating in our educator spotlight series uh you know we've we've been interacting with you for a while because you are someone who always shows up as a star educator and you know through the the pandemic and remote learning uh we really love seeing all of you know what you sent home for your students to continue hands-on i love seeing all of the ways that you've adapted um in all of these different learning environments and you know you're really you provided us with such a wealth of information experience and content and so thank you so much for participating um, and we really look forward to talking to you again soon absolutely thank you all right and that's all from us and uh, everyone have a great day